Hola, gente. This lecture concerns the ancient city of Teotihuacan, the city of the gods, or the city where the gods are made, a name that the Aztecs gave the ancient city nearly 1,000 years after it had already been abandoned, and the Aztecs viewed it for the first time and thought that this is a place surely where the gods are made. They left no written record. They left no statues of leaders. And there's a lot of guesswork going on in who these people were. This lecture is also given within the context of Chicano culture and why um, Ch the Chicano generation in the 1960s drew upon um, these ancient cities as, as a source of history and culture and strength. Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan, the city of the gods, or the city where the gods were made. Um, Teotihuacan, the word is Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs or the Mexica. By the time the Mexica came on the scene, um, Teotihuacan had been abandoned for 1,000 years. Think about that. The Aztecs saw Teotihuacan as we essentially see it today. Um, abandoned, overgrown um, with foliage, and no clue on who had built or who had lived at this amazing um, spot. And the Aztecs were amazed by, by this ancient city and said, um, truly, this is where gods are made, or the city of the gods, Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan flourished from around 400 BCE, before the Common Era, to around 700 CE. And 700 CE is what we consider the Dark Ages or the, the, the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages in Europe. And here's a picture of me uh, standing in front of the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan. I had the privilege of going there um, January 2019 with my son. And um, we spent a couple of weeks in central Mexico going to um, Tenochtitlan, the ruins of the Aztec capital. Uh, we went to Tepeyac, where the Virgin appeared, to Juan Diego. We went to Teotihuacan and other sites, and of course had some amazing food. And I encourage all of you to get down there once the quarantine is over, buy a plane ticket to Mexico City, and go to the Aztec ruins go to Tepeyac, go to Teotihuacan, sit at the top of the pyramid. Sorry, if you hear some noise in the background, that's my kitten playing. Um, it's not, it doesn't cost very much money. Um, you need to go experience these things. And it's not very far away. It's not very expensive. So here's the Pyramid of the Sun. And throughout this um, presentation, I'll, I will be showing you many of the pictures I took at Teotihuacan. And more than just visiting an ancient site, um, I really felt a presence here. And I know that might sound weird to many of you, but this is a powerful place. This is a, a powerful place in, for many respects. Um, and you have to go there to experience it yourself. So this is a massive pyramid, 700 feet long, 200 feet tall. And you see these people climbing it at various stages, right? Um, unless you're really fit, you're going to feel winded. And I did. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not that fit. <laughs> Each of the stages, I had to stop and rest for a while. Um, amazing experience. Let's see. So here are some facts about Teotihuacan. It was a dominant Mesoamerican civilization during the Classic period. So although we will not be covering the Maya, who flourish in what is now the modern nation of Guatemala for the most part. Um, Teotihuacan flourished during that period. When the Maya were flourishing in what is now Guatemala, mostly in Guatemala, Teotihuacan flourished here. Now, even though we have the ruins of this city, we do, we, we do not know, and we, we don't know exactly who built the city. Um, Unlike other civilizations, like the Olmecs, who left these heads of what we believe are rulers, um, the people of Teotihuacan did not erect statues to rulers. 
Not one, which is amazing, isn't it? Which, think about that. What kind of society, what kind of ancient society does not erect statues to rulers? It's very fascinating. They also did not leave us a written word. So there's a lot of guesswork going on here, just like the Olmecs. But even, I think even more so than the Olmecs in some ways, in some ways, because we don't have any effigy statues um, to their rulers. But we know it was, a, it was powerful. This is a major city. Larger in square footage or square miles than modern day San Francisco. It was that large. It rises to prominence in the first century BCE when Rome is rising, when Rome is transitioning from a republic to an empire, um, Teotihuacan rises to prominence, has influence um, in the regions around Bouch. At the height of its power, its population reaches to about 200,000. And for those of you who live in Fresno, um, where I teach, that's half the size of the city of Fresno. Some, that's a massive population for an ancient city. Imagine this pyramid was painted stucco white, gl bright gleaming. Um, there would have been gardens everywhere, priests and soldiers and, and um, a, a, gra a grand marketplace, um, various professions families, kids running around. Imagine, as we walk through these ruins, imagine the city alive. Alive with 200,000 people. The smell of food and um, talking and singing, all these different things you can imagine, the sights and smells of a, of a, a major city, 200,000 people. One profession that's needed to build this amazing city were engineers. This isn't just a mound of dirt. This is a, this is a highly skilled project undertaken by engineers, mathematicians, architects, who are highly skilled in their craft. And this city was laid, in, laid out in a grid-like pattern covering eight square miles. In comparison, San Francisco is seven square miles. So this was larger, the city itself was larger than modern day San Francisco in Mexico. It contained around 2000 apartment complexes. And just recently they found more co apartment complexes um, even further out than they thought existed underneath a modern city next door. So over 2,000 apartment complexes, this residences who were Teotihuacanos, or we don't even know what, what they called themselves. We don't know what they called themselves. We don't know what they spoke. The Aztec called in, called the city Teotihuacan. The Avenue of the Dead is the main road connecting the two pyramids. The two pyramids being um, the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. Teotihuacan's influence collapses around 700 CE, around um, the Dark Ages in Europe. The most prominent features are the Pyramids of the Sun and Moon and the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. And like the Olmecs, um, they were dependent upon the three sisters, squash, beans, and corn, maize. Here's many of these photos, I think most of them are photos I took when I was there at Teatro Conce. Here's a photo I took of the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, a close up. And there were three main, I was sorry, two main gods. Um, Tlaloc, the rain god, and we see Tlaloc around Mesoamerica, um, Chichen Itza. When I was there, I saw efforts or statues of Tlaloc, the rain god, and Quetzalcoatl, of course. Now, even though these gods existed at Teotihuacan, we do, we do not know what these people called these gods. We know 
what the Maya called them, and we know what the Aztecs or the Mexica called them. And we, we, we are superimposing Mexica terminologies on these gods. But they are essentially the same god, um, but we don't know exactly, exactly their names during this time period. We have Quetzalcoatl and Tlaloc, the rain god. Here's a map. And um, here is the temple of Quetzalcoatl down here. When I arrived, me and my son, we, hit, we took a bus and we, our bus parked right, right here. And so our journey in my photos will begin the temple of Quetzalcoatl. We will walk along the Avenue of the Dead um, and then climb the Pyramid of the Sun, descend, and then climb the Plaza of the Moon. And go over here to the priest's quarters, to Quetzal Papa Lotol, and we'll end up there. Any questions? Okay. So here we are down here, the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. And we are looking out in the distance, the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, as we see them right here. Okay. Imagine this place. These are ruins, right? At one time, these buildings were um, much higher. Over the last 2,000 years, uh, what happened to these, these rocks and building materials? What do you think happened to them? They just didn't disappear or dissolve. Um, rock wouldn't dissolve over time, um, not, not just in 2,000 years. Well, people didn't disappear, right? People have been living here ever since. Mexicans have lived here since uh, over the last 2,000 years. And they need things, they need construction materials to build their home. So essentially, this was the Home Depot over the last 2,000 years for Mexicans living about the area. You, you're building a home, you tell your sons to go get some, some rocks from Teotihuacan to help build your home. So that's where the building materials went. Unfortunately, um, we don't have the top of the Temple of Quetzalcoatl any longer, but this is the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, the dragon god, the feathered serpent. And all along the side, you see Tlaloc, the rain god, as well as um, heads of Quetzalcoatl. I would have loved to have known what kind of altar was on top of the here. And again, these are all pictures, pictures I had the honor of taking at this site. Beautiful. And we have... Um, Freezes of Quetzalcoatl within in, in shells, right? The ocean, the ocean is a um, religious space, a spiritual space. Slaloc and Quetzalcoatl. And you see over here we have images of Quetzalcoatl. And we'll see these later um, at Tenochtitlan, the Plaza Mayor in um, Mexico City. Very similar ways that Quetzalcoatl was depicted by the Aztecs 1,000 years after the fall of Teotihuacan. Nearly about 800 years. Here's Maiz. Look at that. Maiz is so honored and such a religious powerful symbol that it has a place on the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. And rain. Why is rain so important to these early peoples? Without rain, you do not live. Right? So you can't go to the store and buy um, bottled water. You, you pray for rain, and you offer sacrifices to Tlaloc, and you pacify his anger and incur his blessings. And if, you're, if you give enough sacrifice, and appease Tlaloc, he will send the rains to you, and the rains will grow corn and sustain your civilization. Rain is water. We heard, hear this term recently, right, in um, protests against the pipelines. Water is life. And we see in these ancient societies that is cer certainly the case. Water is life. 
I think one of the, perhaps the coolest God ever, besides Thor, Odin, right? Mexico's Quetzalcoatl. You cannot get a more awesome God than a dragon God. This is such a powerful God. Quetzalcoatl. Feathered serpent. My, I think it's my favorite God of all time is Quetzalcoatl. Not just because I'm Chicano or Mexican. Oh, well, maybe so. Here's a reproduction at the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City of what this would have looked like. Again, I think I told you in the earlier um, lecture, if you were to go back to the ancient world, whether Teotihuacan or Tenochtitlan or Chichen Itza or Rome or Athens, um, these buildings would have been painted. You wouldn't have gone back to Rome and have seen marble. You, all, all the marble buildings would have been painted in bright reds and bright blues. Same, same as in ancient Mexico. They would have been painted. Apartment complexes. When you first see pyramids in ancient Mexico, you, I, I think there's, there's a disconnect, right? These, these are these powerful monuments. They're, they, they look like they're created by gods or aliens, which is really stupid. I hope none of you think that aliens created these pyramids, right? That takes away the strength of ancient Mexicans. People did this. They were smart, they were strong. Um, they were engineers and, and scribes and professors and mathematicians, and they did this themselves without any help from any kind of aliens. But I don't think, I don't really think we think in terms of, of, of a bustling city, in terms of there's actually apartment complexes where people are living and raising babies and changing diapers and making dinner and arguing with their spouse, you know, that daily kind of thing that we all do. I don't think we'll, we'll really think about those things when we see a pyramids, that these are just real normal people living their lives. Like we live our lives, falling in love, breaking up, getting married, dying, crying, um, drinking bulky, right? <laughs> these are regular people and they lived in apartment complexes with annoying neighbors, loud neighbors, all the kind of thing that humans have to deal with, ancient Mexicans dealt with. Imagine waking, waking up in the morning, going out and stretching and seeing the Pyramid of the Sun as the sun's coming over the horizon. People actually did that. They lived this way. Waking up in the morning, um, eating nobales for breakfast, I know Paulus and tortillas. This is this is what they ate in ancient Mexico: salsa, tortillas, um, tamales. We we know that um, the Aztecs ate tamales because it's in their recipe book. We have a, a list of things that the Aztec emperor Montezuma ate, and he ate tamales. <laughs> they they were normal people, right? Apartment complexes. Honey, I'm home. Oh, you're making tamales or nopales, um, tamales or in salsa, right? Again, these are pictures, pictures I took. Um, here's, here's nopales with the pyramid of a sun in the background and um, apartment complexes. And you can imagine when this was thriving. Imagine the pyramid of a sun in stucco white. Um, and there's, there's flowers. Ancient Mexicans love flowers. Mexicans still love flowers, right? Um, we know when the conquistadors went into Tenochtitlan, they couldn't believe the beautiful gardens. They said they were the most beautiful gardens they'd ever seen in the whole world. The gardens, the beautiful flowers, and then, then they destroyed it. We'll cover that later, which is, I think, the greatest tragedy in human history is when the conquistadors couldn't believe how beautiful the Aztec capital was. They were pinching themselves, they said, because it was so beautiful. They thought they were in a dream. And then they destroyed it. <sighs> but imagine Teotihuacan, there's roses everywhere, right? Ancient Mexicans love their flowers. You can imagine them eating nopal de tacos, right, in the morning. This is a wall, um, the type of construction that the Teotihuacanos used to 
erect some of their walls. Concrete, concrete and rock. Drainage, drainage system, this is an advanced society. Um, the buildings are laid out with great precision, skill, um, mathematics, and they had a drainage system. Rome had a drainage system, right? In some Greek um, societies. You need to get rid of the filth. You need to bring water in and get rid of the waste or else you, your civilization will um, have disease. And we see a drainage system here in ancient Mexico. Highly advanced civilization, highly advanced. Look at that, I wanted to show you this picture I took. Look at these straight lines. How perfect, precise, exact, mathematical these buildings are laid out. These are highly intelligent people, these ancient Mexicans. This is the reason why these cultures show up in Chicano iconography in the 1960s. Because Chicanos are drawing back on a powerful legacy, a powerful legacy of technology, of science, of intelligent design in these ancient societies. And they're using them, they're claiming them as their own. We are Chicanos, we're, we have one foot in the United States and one foot in Mexico, and that foot in Mexico goes all the way back to the Olmecs and to Teotihuacan, which we proudly claim as our heritage. Now we're walking along the Avenue of the Dead from the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, walking toward the Pyramid of the Sun. Here's my son I took, sitting atop one of these um, buildings, playing his um, native flute and taking a selfie. <laughs> he was only 15 at the time. We had a great time. Now we're approaching the Pyramid of the Sun, coming up from the Avenue of the Dead. And here's our first glimpse um, as we approach the Pyramid of the Sun. Look at that um, beautiful building. So this was, this was built during stages. There was a smaller um, pyramid underneath and even a smaller one underneath that going back in time. And you can imagine going back thousands of years as um, the first people who came to this area probably built a, an altar first, perhaps 4,000. No, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing now perhaps 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, maybe even 10,000 years ago, an altar was built. The first stages of civilization, trying to get a hold of the gods, ask them for help, ask them to send rain, ask them to send crops or wild beasts to eat or for protection from the neighboring warring tribe. And as people settle down, they start building a higher mound. And that dirt mound eventually becomes a rock mound. And that rock mound becomes a brick mound. and becomes more precise as professions begin to evolve and mathematicians arise and engineers and scribes and priests and kings until you get a full-blown civilization like this. Bam, that is power, isn't it? That's powerful. Imagine being someone who's not from Teotihuacan during this time. You, you're part of a nomadic tribe who, who comes into the city to, for the marketplace or looking for work and you see this imposing structure. What are you thinking about this? The gods are here, aren't they? This is a powerful, civilization that you should be in awe of and not mess with. This is the throne of God right here. This is the back side or the side, can you see? Over in the corner. And this is our way up. Here, the several pictures next will be walking up. Now we're looking back on the Avenue of the Dead. Higher, higher. Here's my son sitting off in the corner, higher even still. 
Way off in the distance to the far left is Mexico City. Well, that smog was coming from. <laughs> it's about 45 minute drive outside Mexico City, as I remember. And this is at the top, the very top of the Pyramid of the Sun. And you see to the left, the straight road, that's the Avenue of the Dead, leading to the pyramid up in the, mid, the middle top, the Pyramid of the Moon, which is a smaller pyramid, but also still very great. Here's my son. Um, he, he, had a, he had an awesome experience sitting there. We sat there for a couple hours and just contemplating and feeling history. And, you, and perhaps it's, it's all in my head, but you, I think you certainly feel, feel something there. It's a powerful, powerful feeling. Here's a close up looking at the Pyramid of the Moon. Now, of course, again, these are names that we've superimposed. We don't know what the Teotihuacanos is called these pyramids, if they even had a name. We have no idea. Hopefully one day we will know. We'll find some kind of tablet that has mine on there so we can um, decipher the language. That would be awesome. I'm hoping one day we do. Here's a pyramid or the Avenue of the, of the Dead. So we, now we're off the Pyramid of the Sun and we're walking to the Pyramid of the Moon. Imagine these buildings in full effect, painted. There's warriors, there's, there's priests, there's a marketplace going on, there's kids running around, there's old people eating, laughing, having a good time, perhaps dancing, listening, playing music, listening to music. Imagine it, 200,000 people around here. A major city. Along the way, there's, um, there's this, this mural on the Avenue of the Dead, just off to, uh, into a little house, um, Jaguar. And we saw this with the Olmecs, right? We saw a weird Jaguar baby being born. Was, something was happening there at the altar with a half human, half Jaguar baby. And Jaguars have been venerated ever since the Olmecs. And we see a, some sort of veneration here with the Jaguar. And we know the Aztecs or the Mexica have venerated Jaguars also. The Jaguars, been a powerful animal, animal um, throughout Mesoamerican culture and religion. A larger view. And we are approaching the Pyramid of the Moon. That's the Pyramid of the Moon. Look at these amazing straight lines. This is the corner of the stair ascent to the Pyramid of the Moon, right here. I think it's about half the size of the Pyramid of the Sun. So here's a Pyramid of the Sun up in the upper left. The very top was where me and my son were sitting. And now we're at the top of the, we're almost to the top of the Pyramid of the Moon. We can't go all the way to the top because it's cordon off. No one's allowed to climb the, the last stage because it's crumbling. Now they need to protect it. So we're about 75% up on the Pyramid of the Moon. <laughs> Please go here. I want you all to go here. You will not be um, sorry you went. You'll be very gratified, deeply gratified. I sigh because I wish I was there right now. And off to the right of this, um, are these quarters, which uh, um, archeologists and historians believe um, priests live, the priestly quarters. And here's a bilingual plaque. If you don't know Spanish, you can read it in English. Plaza of the Moon. So they believe that priests lived here next to the pyramids. Imagine this room, a priest is there studying, praying, This is ancient art right here. Ancient wallpaper painted onto the wall. <laughs> Beautiful. I love this room. So beautiful. Ancient Mexico.
it seems like a movie set, doesn't it? It seems so fantastic, but it's real. At one time, priests lived here. Real people, real Mexicans, ancient Mexicans lived here. Ate, laughed, fought, loved and died, just like we do here. Artisans, right? There's many artists living here. Beautiful jade mask from Teotihuacan, close up. And bones, let's read this out. This is from National Geographic. Members of a pre-Aztec civilization used human bones. This is referring to Teotihuacan. Used human bones, likely from their freshly dead relatives, to make buttons, combs, needles, spatulas, and dozens of other everyday utensils, Mexican archaeologists say. Femurs, or thigh bones, tibias, shin bones, and human skulls were transformed into household items shortly after death, noted team leader Abigail Meza Piñalosa, of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. The Teotihuacanos used different stones as knives to finally remove the flesh and muscles from the bone, Meza Piñalosa said. The bodies had to be as fresh as possible, she added, because after a person dies, his or her bone quickly becomes too fragile to sculpt. So someone dies and you make a coffee mug out of it. That's, a, that's what they're essentially saying. Here's a beautiful mural. This is a reproduction, but this is what it would have looked like that was painted in an apartment complex. So imagine waking up in the morning, you live in the apartment complex, you walk out in the hallway and this mural's there. And this, this, is, um, this is the great goddess of Teotihuacan. So we have Tlaloc and Quetzalcoatl, and we also have the great goddess of Teotihuacan. Even though, even though we don't have any statues to her, here's a mural to her. And you can spend lots of time um, de examining this awesome mural. And we, we, we saw in a previous lecture that um, we saw the very, the very first mural created in Mexico was Olmec influenced in a cave. And from that point on, we have murals in Mexico going all the way from the Olmecs to Teotihuacan, to Tenochtitlan, to Los Angeles, Chicano, Los Angeles. There's, oh, sorry, I forgot the Mexican muralist, right? Um, Rivera and um, those guys that we'll cover later. Um, Mexican muralism goes back two, 3,000 years, and Teotihuacan was part of it. You can spend time looking at this, right? There's lots going on here. The great goddess, there's corn, there's maize seeds below her. She's giving water, the rain's coming. There's priests offering her um, sacrifices and reaping the benefits of the earth. The earth is alive. Her headdress is made of this teeming tree of life, it seems. And there's water giving life. And there's, there's, there's insects and small animals living within her, this headdress, this fountain of life. There's fish and, and birds and insects and butterflies with smiles. <laughs> it's, it's a powerful, beautiful, um, vibrant, alive painting. I love the little creatures. Some of them look like they have smiles. I'm not sure if they're, that's supposed to be that way. But um, beautiful. Life. That's one word that comes to my mind is this life. And that's the end of our presentation. The next day, um, 
my son and I went to a small village, or so it's a, it's a town um, nearby called Tepotzlan. And Tepotzlan was an Aztec town, right? Um, above the town are these mountains, and atop one of the cliffs is an Aztec temple. Tepotzlan. If you can, if you can go to Tepotzlan, it's an amazing place. Go there. And we ate crickets. I think they're grasshoppers or, or chapelines, right? They were good. They were salty. We ate them with nachos and guacamole. <laughs> well, I hope you got something out of this video and you see why Chicanos are drawing upon these ancient cities as a foundation of strength and culture.